So, find the distance between these two points. We're looking to um, recall our distance formula, which if you remember, I think it's a good idea whenever you're doing these problems, especially early on, whenever you learn a new formula, write that formula down several times, okay? Uh, maybe every time you do a new problem, you write that formula down, and then eventually... You won't have to because you'll you'll burn it into your memory, right? Okay, so that's our distance formula. Remember, uh, the x's and y's are, are from our ordered pairs. Uh, I'm going to write my 42 over one or comma 150, kind of like that. Okay, uh, just so I have my x's stacked on top of one another, my y's stacked on top of one another. It makes my mental math a little bit easier. But we're going to do distance is equal to now the formula says subtract your x's. So I'm going to take these two values, and I don't care the order that I do it, I'm going to subtract them. Okay? So what's 42 minus 6? Thirty-six. 36. Okay, and we're going to square that, right? Now, I don't care about the order, because if I went 6 minus 42, it would have been negative 36, right? Well, negative 36 squared is the same thing as positive 36 squared. Okay? Um, now I'm going to do the same thing with my... Y's, so negative 10 minus 150, negative 10 minus 150, 160, and it's negative, right? I don't really care if it's negative, it could be positive. If I get 160 there, I'm going to square that, correct? Okay. Now, because these are really large numbers, you probably grab your calculator, which I don't have an issue with that. Most people don't, off the top of their head, have 36 squared memorized. So we'll square that number, 1296, and they probably don't have 160 memorized. Maybe they have 16 memorized. That would help. Uh, but we square that, and we get 256 or 2,000, 2,500 or 25,600. Okay, it's not that big. It's all relative. Two five six zero zero. The reason I said it might be useful to know that what the square of sixteen is sixteen squared gives me two fifty six. That's a ten there, right? Ten squared is a hundred, and that's where those two zeros come from. Okay. So though I don't have one sixty squared in my mind, I do know how to piece it together so that I can uh, develop it quickly from previous ideas or, or, or things that relate well to it. So now, we're going to take those two numbers, okay, 1296, can I grab that, nope, 1296 plus uh, 2000, or 25,600, keep saying that wrong, gives me that, right? And that's underneath the square root, okay, but guess what that's going to end up being? Two, six, eight, nine, six. Gives me a perfect uh, whole number, right? So that tells me that this number, uh, two, six, eight, do you see here? Okay, so the 26896 number, glad I went through all that, that worked, uh, is a perfect square. So I take the square root of it, I do get that 164. And that's what every one of those questions should have showed up as, okay? They are going to give you large, obnoxious numbers, um, but when I sum them together, that number right there, just the way the, the question was, was pieced together uh, by the programmers, that number right there will always be a perfect square for question number three. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. Um, something we talked about in the last class is how we could get that 164 without our calculator. Okay. So I'll show you that here in a little bit. We'll use a smaller number than uh, 26,896, but um, let's do question four before we get to that. Because question four, I think, asks you 
to write your answer as a rounded decimal, right? Nearest thousand. So it's going to change things a little bit. And this is this is the thing, guys. If I, if I look at um, Math Excel and the the instructions they provide you in some of the questions, kind of provide you insight on what's going to happen. The last question said round, or not round. It said uh, type in an exact answer or using radicals. So that basically tells you you're either going to use your calculator, and your calculator is going to give you a whole number back. Or if your calculator gives you a decimal back, you've got to use a different approach I'll, that I'll show you here in a moment. This one here says round to the nearest thousand. Okay, that tells me to use my calculator because that's going to evaluate it and give me the decimal approximation of this distance. Okay, so those things written in blue there are very informative, uh, kind of beforehand. Uh, that, that maybe out of the textbook, uh, you wouldn't get that instruction or that that additional help. Uh, so I'm going to write down negative 22 over, or comma negative 9 there. And now I'm going to do my distance formula. So I remember my distance formula is take your x's and subtract them. So it's negative 20 minus negative 22. What's that give me? 2. Okay. So I'll get 2, and we have to square that, right? Okay. Add to that then. Okay, 6 minus negative 9. 6 minus negative 9 is 15. And we'll square that. Okay. So 2 squared is 4. 15 squared. Anybody know 215? Or 15 squared? It's not 215. I misspoke. It starts with 2. 225. Okay. So the distance then is radical 229. Okay. Well, radical 229, 229 is not a perfect square. Okay. Uh, so we'd have to do some work with that. But our calculator, if we type in, our calculator will give us that decimal approximation. Okay. And they want to the thousands place, right? What? How many place values over is thousands? Three. So there's tenths, hundredths, thousandths. Okay, and then we're gonna look at the one to tell me whether I round up or down, right? So I keep it at 5.385. Okay, just something, just because I know it's gonna happen to somebody at some point. So I want to make sure we um, don't do this every year. I get somebody to uh, to mess up rounding. Okay, because they do this. They say, well, this one is going to round that five. And they say, well, that five is going to round that eight. Does that make sense? Have you ever f found yourself in that kind of situation? Okay. People do that every year. I always have five or six people say, well, it's, it's a continual rounding procedure all the way down until I get to the decimal or, or somehow where they decide to stop. You round one time. They want this place value. You look at that number and it tells you how to adjust that one. And then you're done. You don't go any further than that. Okay, um, happens every year, so make sure that we, we don't do that. All right. Say again. Why is it what? Ah, oh, good call. Should be 229. So it's 15.1327, so now 7 tells me around the 2 to a 3. Okay, my fault. Is that doable? Okay, just make sure if we're going to type things in, we type it in right. Um, let's see if we can do that by hand. Is there anything? 229, okay, is a. I want to go 229, and I don't want to type it in as. Um, a decimal. I don't want to approximate it. I want an exact answer, but I want a simplified answer. Okay? So let me see real quick. 229 might be prime. Yep. 
Okay. Uh, so let's not do 229 because it is a prime number. Let's do... What's prime mean? You guys remember what prime numbers mean? And one in themselves. Okay. So 229 is prime. So if they ever ask me to simplify it and leave it as a simplified radical like question number three did, I would leave it as radical 229. That's fully simplified. But let's say I had something like... Uh, Oh, let's go 192. Okay. 192 is not a prime number. Okay. It ends in 2, so what will definitely divide 192? 2. two. Okay. So I'm going to take 192, divide it by 2. Okay. This is called factoring. Factoring is just a fancy word for division, right? Okay. If I have a product, 192 is the product. I'm going to tell you that 2 is a factor. What is the other number I multiply by to get 192? So to, to find that other number, don't I just take 192 divided by 2? And what's that give me? 96? Okay. Now 2, what kind of number is 2? Is 2 a composite number or is it a prime number? What is 2 divisible by? Careful. Itself, it's divisible by 2, right? And only 1, right? A number can only be divisible by things that are less than it, correct? Right? And when we talk about things that are, um, you know, when we're doing the, the factorization here, we want whole number factors, okay? Uh, so we're really only looking at numbers that are less than half of 2, or numbers that are less than half of 96. Um, so, because 2, the only number that's less than half of 2 is 1. 1 is already the number that divides 2 completely. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. So, 2 is the first prime number that we ever have. Okay. 1 is not considered prime. If you, if you ever have that question, by definition, we state that a prime number is a number greater than 1 that is divisible by itself and 1. Okay. So, 1 is not prime. 2 is our first prime number, okay? 96 is composite, okay? 96 is divisible by 2, right? 2 and what? Forty-eight, okay? 2 is prime. What about 48? 2 and 24, okay? What about 24? 2 and 12? 12 is 2 and 6, and 6 is 2 and 3, and 3 is prime, okay? So we kind of, we kind of do this division. We keep uh, breaking down composite numbers until we find all prime values, okay? Uh, we call this a, a we call it the prime factorization 192, but a lot of times people call this a factor tree. Does it look like branches of a tree and stuff like that? You stop when the branches reach prime numbers. Okay, what this means to us, there's several different ways of writing this, but I'm going to take radical 2 times radical 2, so that one, that one, another radical 2, which is that one, and I got three more, so radical 2, radical 2, radical 2, and then I got my radical 3. So I rewrite them that way. And what that tells me is that if I take those, and I'm not going to pay attention to the radicals when I type this on my calculator, but if I type those in, I had six twos. I got 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. There's 6 of them. And then times my 3, the number I get should be what we started with, 192, right? So we've broken down it to all of its prime factors. Every number can be done that way, okay? Um, now, to simplify it, what we do is we look at the, we start grouping them in pairs of 2. Okay, two objects, two similar objects. Because radical 2 times radical 2 is radical 4. But what's radical 4? 2. So this becomes a perfect square. Does that make sense? That product becomes a perfect square, so it becomes a 2. What about that one? Does that become another 2? And then that group becomes another 2, right? And this doesn't have a group, so it just stays as radical 3. But all this stuff is still multiplied together, so we end up with 8 radical 3 
as our simplified value or simplified version of radical 192. Okay, and basically what we're trying to do here when we simplify a radical is we're trying to find the largest perfect square that divides 192. The largest perfect square that divides 192. And 64 does that. 64, if I divide 192 by 64, you get 3. Okay? Well, 192 divided by 64, but 3 shows up there. If I take square root of 64, 8 is the square root of 64. Does that make sense? So when we're simplifying radicals, you're going to hear me say, what is the largest rat or what is the largest perfect square that you can divide out of there? Okay? Um, and what's really nice, when we say divide out, we're thinking divide evenly. Okay, so I get a, a whole number result back. And the logic then, the, 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 the prime number theory is, if I have 192, okay, I'm looking for perfect squares that are basically less than half of 192. So half of 192 is 96, right? So I only have to see if, if 192 divides by perfect squares that are less than 96. And those are 4, uh, what, 9, 16, 25, 36, and then 64, or 49 and then 64, right? So those are the only ones I really have to try to see if 192 divides evenly by them. Um, and that's something that we're going to practice and get a lot of uh, work at throughout the year, but I just wanted to, uh, to show that to you. If you're a person that you know you struggle with radicals, because go ask anybody that's taken this course in the past, we will use this on a regular basis, um, you know, probably starting in November. We will do this on, a, on almost a daily basis, okay? So we need to be able to do that. So if you're struggling with that, if you know you're going to struggle with that, okay, on my website, all the way at the bottom here, got us a link for radicals. Radicals become a very, very, very important part of this course which you learned in um, Algebra 1, or should have learned in Algebra 1. There's a lot of applets here that allow you to kind of practice that, okay? But then there's a series of videos here that show us how to simplify all these in this row, or this column, or simplifying radicals, doing what we just did. You got all your operations uh, that we do with radicals as well. And those are, every skill that's in here is going to be something that becomes very, very important for you in this course, okay? Uh, it's a prerequisite skill, so uh, if you know you sucked at it last year, please take the time ahead of time to revisit that kind of stuff, okay? Um, do you guys think 